Thank you for joining the Hebrew Bible Institute in another study. My name is John Lyons. I'm here with Pastor Sasha Bolotnikov and my good friend, Savannah Carlson. Savannah, would you mind reading our introductory text, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21? Absolutely. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. If you haven't guessed yet, uh, our question today is about prophecy and about Scripture. Namely, has the integrity of Scripture been truly preserved? I will leave it to you to start us on that journey. Yes, it is a very important question. Uh, and uh, for me, it was fundamental question. Uh, growing up in the communist, atheist Soviet Union, uh, in school we had a class which is called scientific atheists. Uh, the purpose of this class, you can imagine, was to prove by science that God does not exist. And so they were saying God does not exist and that, but there is a church and the church, uh, as, as they say, uh, the church is the opium for people. So <laughs> hmm. Re- religion is the opiate of the masses. Yes. I think. yes yeah. Thank you for correct <laughs> translation, but yes, that's exactly right. So, uh, they were saying basically that the church has, uh, uh, you know, created all this, you know, uh, what is called the Bible, you know, they wrote stuff in what they wanted to write, you know, they changed, you know, uh, Jesus never even existed, or even if he existed, he didn't say what he said, and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So Fables and, and clever fabrications. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, f- since uh, uh, my time at Andrews University, uh, I had uh, a professor, Johannes Erbas, who was actually a big specialist in the text of the Bible, and I got this bug from him when I took <laughs> a couple classes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of start showing you a couple things that I've brought. So as I jokingly say, this is my Bible. <laughs> uh, I think you need to get a little bigger one there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, look at that. Wow. That's beautiful. So, tell us about it. What is this? This is the first Christian Bible mm-hmm. as we know it. Okay. Well, uh, there are several different uh, copies. This is a uh, like bound book. That's why it's called Codex. And I have. Uh, I'm lucky to get a hand on the facsimile edition of what is known as uh, uh, Codex uh, Vaticanus. Mm. Okay. And I, I immediately have questions. Um, I mean, I, I can see that this is written in Greek. This looks like a, like a different language, perhaps, or different set of characters? Yes. Uh, uh, they sometimes have some additional... Uh, stuff on the pages, you know, that's what textologists are using. You know, like I switch through several and you can see, uh, different, but usually in majority of the pages where the texts of the Bible is, as I can show it uh, to our viewers here. Um, this is uh, written, as you can see, in uh, uh, only capital letters. <laughs> yeah. It was written. But what it has, it has here this section uh, right here. It's uh, the section which is a part of the Old Testament, and this is the New Testament. So definitely New yeah. Testament uh, is uh, in Greek. You know, here is like they say, prot Hebraeus, so it's Hebrews and stuff like this. And you have uh, other books. So this is uh, in Greek. But the Old Testament um, has been uh, translated uh, from Greek into Hebrew. Oh. I mean, sorry, from Hebrew into Greek. That makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, from Hebrew into Greek. You know, there's a whole story about how the five books of Moses were translated in the second century. Mm. It's called the Septuagint. So, mm-hmm. uh, 
uh, basically, you know, more or less all, you know, the books of our Bible and uh, the content uh, is, is very similar, I would say. The content is very similar. And this manuscript is dated to uh, sixth century. Wow. That's amazing. So, uh, as you can see, uh, the Bible, mm, you know, has been going on. The Bible text has been going on for uh, many, many centuries. And, of course, since we're talking about Hebrew, I have another Bible here. Oh, let me have this Bible. I take it out and I put it in here. And so... This is my favorite. It has a story to it. Oh. This is the copy of the Hebrew Old Testament from which uh, the Bibles that we are reading today are translated. Oh, that's cool. And I can see it's quite literally a, a photocopy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a facsimile of the original codex. The codex is uh, still now in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. This is why it's called the Leningrad Codex. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, it has a very interesting uh, history to it. Uh, it's dated uh, originally to the 10th century. And... Uh, uh, it was found in Crimea and then in the uh, 19th century and was presented to the Tsar Nicholas uh, I. And so uh, in 1936, uh, 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 a biblical scholar, Rudolf Kittel, who happened to be living in the Nazi Germany, but he lived in Stuttgart, and they had this Bible Institute for many years. He decided to prepare a typesetting to to this text, uh, because as you can see, this is handwriting. Right. This is this is handwriting. We're way before, you know. Uh, and so uh, the typesetting to this text, uh, he needed he needed this text because this is the. Uh, only complete uh, text of the Hebrew Old Testament uh, which we have. I have another one I can briefly show right here. I have to kind of reach out for it. Yeah, this one is very interesting text. And the very similarly done, that is, uh, oh, yeah, this is what is called the Aleppo Codex. Okay, so this is the same text right here, and in fact, it was done by the same, uh, for the, by the scribes from the same uh, family. In fact, and the notes to this codex, which we have, both of these were initially started uh, to be copied in uh, Caesarea, which was uh, back then in uh, the uh, Palestine, which was under the Arab rule at this time, Marab Khalifat. And it was also everywhere. We don't know the full history of it. Uh, the tragedy with this original codex which exists. It's, um, this one is at, uh, it, it, this one is in Jerusalem. Uh, it's preserved in the, uh, you know, Museum of Israel, Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. But it was tragic because, um, when in 1948, uh, the state of Israel was created, this codex was in a synagogue in the Syrian town of Aleppo. The anti-Jewish riots started. Mm. They, set the synagogue on fire mm. and this uh, part of the codex was burned. Mm. So they burned all the way to the book of Deuteronomy. So we don't have Genesis, Exodus, oh. and Leviticus and Numbers here. But still, and that's why this is, this is the complete and it was known to be the complete copy. Um, so the, this German scholar, uh, Rudolf Kittel, uh, he sends a request to the Soviet Union uh, to borrow this book. 
so that he could prepare a typeset and to print the Hebrew Bible. And again, <laughs> the situation is bad, so he returned this book uh, right before the World War II broke out. Mm. When he returned this book, it was sent back to Leningrad. But just in time. Just yes, in time, yeah. But the, th the thing hasn't yet. Uh, well, the 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 the, tri the journey hasn't finished. So now the Nazi Germany attacks Soviet Union, and the army group North moves to Leningrad and encircles it and blockades it. Mm. So in proper Leningrad had all kinds of different uh, uh, art and other antiquities in the museum. So hastily, the Soviets began to evacuate uh, whatever they see as uh, valuable. This was evacuated happily because the next thing happened when the blockade was, uh, when, when the city was blocked and the railroad was cut off, you know, the... Germans began to shell the city. One of the bombs hit the library, breaks through the ceiling, and explodes right where this cod codex would be sitting. But it was taken away. So now we have the, the, the testimony that what was done uh, by the Institute in Stuttgart is still, you know, intact. And so God... I can I can spend hours talking about different biblical manuscript, how God was able to actually preserve them for us to verify. Yeah, and the stories of these codexes and the fact that we still have them thousands of years later is amazing. Yes. And it shows that God wanted to preserve this for us so that we could understand our history with him who he is, where he came from, why we should believe. That's amazing. Yes. What is interesting, I want to show you a little bit about uh, this. How do we know that this is reliable? Yeah. So you see here, there's three columns, and then you see a little bit of science here and here writing. So this is how the copyist worked. And Judaism, they believe that every, not only that the word of God is holy, because we just read, you know, it was written by the holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, in which sense moved. So Jews were extremely, extremely particular and conservative about this business of inspiration. They believe that every single letter is inspired. Okay. Not just, you know, what is written, but every single letter. So they were so meticulously, and, and imagine here they have to use a stylus, which is kind of crude, yeah. and or a feather, I don't know what kind of stylus, and the ink, so it's very, you know, I don't know if you ever dealt with calligraphy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's challenging. <laughs> it is. And the finer point you have, the easier it is to make finer marks. But I can imagine that their pens or their stylus or whatever would have been hand carved. So making sure you had a very fine point to create the detail that we see in here would have been challenging. Yes, that's the one thing. Number two, smudges. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when he has a page and you have a smudge, and it uh, ruins a text, he has to throw away the entire page. Wow. And by the way, this is uh, originally a veal skin. Okay. So, so he writes on the skin, he has this page, and then he has a text which he's copying from. Uh, it is a miracle this these texts are is preserved because traditionally, and again, this is a Jewish tradition. When the text copying is uh, finished, uh, it means that the previous text already getting old, 
and it's not they see it as a desecrate you know starting to die mm. right. so what they're going to do with the old text they're going to put it for uh, 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 into a special preservation place they call it Geniza and when enough uh, uh, writing is accumulated there because they see anything on which the name of God is written as sacred and holy so when it's full when this kind of uh, uh, storage is full they're going to put it in a box and uh, and have a special like burial of it oh okay that's why we don't have it's hard to get a hold of the old stuff but it's a miracle that we have it so here he copies and he sees that the original text has some misspelling he includes that misspelling because yes. that is inspired Yes, he doesn't correct misspelling. So what he does, he's going to put all these different notations. Oh. What he's noticed. And so then he makes a comments about this notation right here at the bottom. So this notation and this, you know. Uh, so... It's it's amazing, you know, I've spent a couple semesters with different professors trying to parse all these notes. Like, the story is there. The story of what he has done is there. And the most exciting part I'm going to show you here is uh, basically you find it in a book of Deuteronomy here. This is... The end of the book uh, of uh, Deuteronomy, I'm going to point uh, one second. And they have a record here of how, so basically like a final. Uh, final uh, record report here. Uh, and they're going to tell in this report how many uh, verses hold on here yeah this is what i was looking right here i'll show it to you okay see this is this is his like report about what he has done and so i'm going to read to you uh how many verses uh, in the books, then it says how many words in the entire Torah, and then how many letters. So his goal is, what he does after the end of this one, especially this about how many letters, and it's 400,800 something. So how many letters? So he's going to count all of them. And from the manuscript here to the manuscript here, the count needs to match. Wow. <laughs> and it's very a, time consuming. And very methodical to yes. ensure consistency. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So seeing this story behind in this master, and I can tell more, like uh, 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Because, I mean, this is, this is 10th century. Of course, you know, way past uh, Moses or Isaiah. But Dead Sea Scrolls, 2nd century BC. So they find the book of Isaiah, which is complete, and they go and compare this with this. Uh, this is Hosea, so my Isaiah is going to be right here. Yeah, right here. So they, they go compare. What's in the Dead Sea Scroll? Isaiah, what is the text is identical. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean... Well, with a process like that, how could it not be? <laughs> I, I mean, but still, there are human beings behind oh, each yeah. of these copies. And while they may have had this incredible process, we're still human beings. So you would think that it wouldn't be exactly the same. It's incredible that it is. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about 100% identical in a sense of every letter is the same. Right. But I mean, the content. Yeah, the, exactly. The story, the prophecy, the information. Yeah, everything. Yeah. You know, you want to find about the, the prophecy about, you know, Messiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls and here. It's there. Everything is there. This is great. And I could spend all day listening to you tell us about these and just even just 
pouring over them myself, but there's a problem. And this does tie us back into our, our topic. I can't read these. And I, I assume you can't read this either. I wish I could. How cool would that be? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. when we, when we talk about the Bible, you know, scripture in English or in other modern languages, um, what does that look like? And how can we be sure that the accuracy that was given such attention to has been preserved in other translations? Uh, as good, we have about 60 different translations in the English <laughs> language. I feel spoiled. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, which one are you using? I am currently using the New American Standard Bible, uh, updated edition. I don't think it's the most recent one, um, but it's... Yeah, yeah that, that one, I, I always uh, believe it's uh, a good translation. Um, I kind of don't like read English Bible for my own uh, reading and study. Why I, would you when you have this? <laughs> yeah, I either go to the original or to the Russian. Well, you know, I don't know. Like the Russian Bible it was interesting because all there was only at the time I became a believer, there was only one translation of the full Bible. There were a couple Jewish translation of the Torah and Old Testament, but the full Bible and see, there was only one translation. And the way how they printed it, no matter what size of the Bible is, it's laid out the same. So it was very easy to get visual memory and like i know some of the verses i back then now i don't do this because i have this machine uh it helps me but back then i remember uh like oh it's on that page is it's on that corner and i would not miss it yeah yeah i don't know if you had uh, the bible which was always with you what, what's what's your experience, Savannah? Which Bible is always with you? Uh, I typically use the New International Version. When I was baptized, I was gifted an NIV version uh, engraved with my name. And so that's the one that I have read um, throughout the years. I've, le- I've definitely read other versions, but I always come back to the NIV. Mm-hmm. Why do you like NIV? Uh, I appreciate the the way that it's written. It seems like it's an accurate translation. Um, but I don't, I'm not an expert on translations. Um, I know that there's a scale of like, these are more interpretive. These are more like direct, uh, translations. And so I'm, I'm, I think that the NIV tends more towards, a the mid range on accurate. <laughs> yeah. It's called the uh, correct. So basically each translator, uh, has to struggle, not translator, because usually, uh, what, uh, what you have, uh, is, uh, a group of scholars who do the translation. Um, that's uh, that's the way how it was done into English language uh, since the time of King James. Mm. Uh, and I think it's the right way. Uh, not you know going to the King James Bible. Uh, probably difficult for modern English reader to read the King James, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Some of the traditions I know among the Caribbean islands, they still like to go and do the Bible bowls with the King James Bible. Can you imagine doing that? I mean, the language is beautiful, but it's much harder to understand. (laughs) (laughs) So the Bible bowl they do uh, here using probably New International, right? You know, I'm not sure. Do you know? I don't. <laughs> I've never. I was never in Pathfinders myself. <laughs> I, I never did Pathfinder Bible experience, so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, okay, I need to ask which yeah. translation because, boy, memorization of the text and the wordings. I mean, uh, the uh, if you compare, like, let's say, uh, there are more literal translations, like uh, New American Standard. I kind of like it, but I know that some people say that the English is a bit rough. Yeah. Uh, because it's more of word for word rather than phrase by phrase. Exactly. So uh, when you go word, the more word for word you go from Hebrew into English or Greek, even Greek into English, the more rough it will sound. It won't be, you know, your English will start disappearing. Yeah, it's, it's harder to read smoothly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, your English will start. So uh, that's why you have uh, dynamic translations. Like New International is a very typical dynamic translation. Uh, besides couple things in it, uh, you know, which I don't want to get into it, but uh, generally it's good for people. Uh, at least I've noticed, like, uh, uh, it was gifted to you in your school, uh, when you were in school, and you were fine. Yeah. Because uh, I now, now I have, a, a, you know, a, a child who is a school age. I kind of get to understand how, because my son was born here, so I, you know, went through the, started through the first grade, so I know how uh, English, uh, you know, development uh, is... Uh, <laughs> here, you know, it's not my experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but I was seeing, okay, that one is kind of difficult. Like if I give him to read King James Bible, nah, I don't want to read that. Yeah. You know, even probably in your American, he's not going to be interested in reading. You need to grow into, you know, more, more, uh, it's probably, a, I don't know if they say new international and would it be right to say like sixth, seventh grade level reading? Probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's generally the age bracket they go for, you know, <laughs> at that, at that an average person, no matter what their age of schooling could read it. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then, uh, and then like New American Standard Bible, it's probably going to be, you know, you have to have a high school education to uh, appreciate it. Would you say? Yeah. yeah. I would so, say so. I, I think my parents picked this out for me because they knew I was ahead in like english and just mm -hmm. linguistic yeah mm -hmm. so so you see you see where i'm uh where, and it's especially important for our viewers to understand that there is no like uh first of all as as my professor Arbus said and he knew 15 languages uh, modern languages you know he knew german english french you know i i've seen german bibles and french bibles so uh, I kind of uh, know how it's work. It's the same way. There is no absolutely perfect translation. There is no translation which would be absolutely impeccable with no single mm -hmm. little bit of thing. So you can't find that. So if somebody is uh, that kind of uh, picky, mm. uh, there are many different ways to learn original languages. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's it's uh, one of the, I guess, double-edged sword of language is that, you know, nuance is going to be lost if you transition from one yeah, to another. Uh, one of the big thing, you can translate the nuance, but then in English it would, it would sound funny. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, th I think the natural question then is how do we know that translated scripture is still considered inspired by God? Because we do lose some of that nuance in translation. Well, the message definitely doesn't change. That's that's important thing. You may have uh, on a little different, you know, details and things like this, uh, you can have a you know, even theologians debate on this. Not the theologians, but rather those who do exegesis of the Bible. Because there are all kinds of different levels. And there are some texts which are difficult. But 95% of the biblical text is fairly clearly understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the message is communicated pretty much accurate. Consistently, no matter which version yeah, or translation. Yeah, you, it may be spoken in a more difficult English or in more easy English, and there will be minuses and pluses of that, but it's still going to be the same message. So, just like we discussed with um, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Codex, there's minor differences, but they have the same message. The same is true of all the different translations. Um, so, I guess then the question is, as I'm choosing a Bible, how do I know what version or translation to get for myself? Well, depends. Uh, first of all, each translation would have an introduction, so you know what uh, uh, the history of it. 
So uh, if I were to choose a gift for a teenager, that would be New International Bible. Mm -hmm. um, generally for preaching, uh, I use New King James. It's kind of a middle ground. Uh, people tend to, uh, maybe I'm used to it uh, the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I like New, Inter New American Standard, but New American Standard would fit some people uh, who want to go into more details, but they don't know, uh, they don't have an access to the original Hebrew or Greek. That would be probably the more for uh, a detailed uh, things. So, there are many other Bibles, like um, I'm, I'm just comparing like NIV and ESV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, ESV seem to be mm, in the same, and a different but dynamic translations. And I know uh, it's getting more and more, uh, you know, popular. Yeah. Uh, what about things like the New Living Translation or more interpretive, the message? Um, mm -hmm. Do those have a place in Bible study? Uh, maybe in devotions. Mm. Uh, yeah, some people like this, uh, like, uh, as I say, the message, or uh, there is, the, uh, f you know, there's a famous, uh, he was a professor at Southern uh, for many years, Jack Blanco, mm. and he did his own uh, version, which again, he stated personally uh, many times that he was never meant, he never meant to have it done, uh, you know, as a translation was more for a devotional. Yeah. Right. Is is that the um, the clear word? Yeah, the clear word. The clear yes, word. Okay. yes. And uh, uh, the NLT is also devotional style. So I would not uh, argue a point that this is how it's supposed to be based on the NLT. Sure. If you want argue a point, you would probably use something like New American Standard or New Revised Standard or New King James. That would probably be more close to the original. But if you uh, dealing with like you want to do a, like a Bible study with somebody or you want to just do it your daily reading, like somebody wants to read the Bible book by book by book, only international would be good, you know, because it will give you the concept of what's in there, you know. So depends. You, you, you know what's in a book. You want a little deeper, do more literal. You want to uh, have a smooth reading, do you new, do new international uh, ESV and stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor. This has been very informative. I've quite enjoyed pouring over the, the copies that you have here and that you were able to take us on this journey um, about how scripture is inspired by God. I hope you were inspired. And I want to inspire you to leave a comment. When you do, let us know where you're writing from. We'd love to hear from you. And we hope to see you next time here at the Hebrew Bible Institute. God bless you.